Thank you, Tendai, um, and uh, good evening once again to the um, guests on the platform. My name is Norman Moyo. Um, I like to call myself Pan-African, but I've spent um, many years uh, working in the continent, uh, having started with work with Standard Chartered Bank in Zimbabwe, and then moved on to Econet at a very early stage of my career. I had a fling, I like to call it a fling, with the hotel group Cresta Hospitality for four years before I moved on to Zambia, where I was the commercial director for Celtel. Um, spent two years in Zambia and then I got promoted to Nigeria, at least on a piece of paper. It looked like a promotion until I landed on the ground. It, it turned out it was a very difficult task, but I had a beautiful three years in Nigeria made some great strides, managed to achieve a number of accolades, including the top 40 global telecoms business leader under the age of 40 for some of the work that we did there. I, after paying my school fees in Nigeria, I moved to Bahrain in the Middle East with the same company, Celtel, where I spent uh, nearly a year and a half there. So in total, I spent six years moving around the group called CELTA. I then moved to Tanzania, where I was running firstly Etisalat as a CEO. Then I pivoted to Helios Towers, where I was also CEO for Helios Towers. And I spent five years uh, in total in um, Tanzania. I was then headhunted back to Econet where I came to set up an energy business uh, since 2015. And that has been my journey in the past five years, trying to find an energy solution to the continent's problems. Let's just say that's my day job. So I do have a day job, a night job, and a midnight job. And my day job today is running the energy business called Distributed Power Africa, which is a part of Econet Group. My night job, I happen to be in property management and crowdfund, property crowdfunding. And that started as far back as 2013, where I challenged a number of my black brothers and sisters to say, as a people, we chase three Bs incessantly booze, BMWs, and babes. I attend I may be bays. I don't know what B works. And I said, we need to have a different mindset as a people. We need to learn to come together and build wealth for ourselves and for the next generation. And the secret to wealth is not hidden from us. It is also available to us. And we need to learn to come together and collaborate as a people. So I challenged 30 Pan-African executives when I was still in Tanzania. And fast track five years later, they all came together, put $1,000 each every month for three years solid. And we ended up with around a million dollars worth of properties that we bought here in South Africa and based in South Africa, just between four ways and Santon. Very nice lifestyle apartments and they are all being rented. And when I shared the story, which I shared just now on the group, I have received a tremendous feedback from people who are saying, how can we also be part of that story? And I said, it's a mindset, it's a discipline, but it's also about never despising small beginnings. We started as a very small boutique a group of people. I'm a golfer, at least on a good day. So we started as a small group of people and we ended up today we manage, we own and manage around 95 properties. And all of a sudden we have now launched a crowdfunding platform for property that allows a lot of Pan-Africans to now, for a minimum of $1,000, they can own a fraction of an apartment in the top suburbs of Johannesburg. Why Johannesburg? That's our beginning. We continue to hunt the proper space in the continent. So that's my night job. So I do have a midnight job. My midnight job is I'm an author of a leadership book, Rumble in the Jungle. You will be able to find it on LinkedIn, on Amazon, 
on Kindle and on Audible. It's a book that I wrote after many years in the continent, having worked with some terrific companies in the continent. And as a tribute to the continent I love most, so I dedicated that book. But the book also takes me to a lot of corporate offices, strategy rooms, with a lot of blue chip companies in the continent, where I basically cover strategy, execution, leadership, and cash. I talk about that and I open up a lot of uh, strategy sessions for a number of blue chip companies. I also lecture at Stellenbosch Business School. So essentially, that's my background, Tendai, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Tendai. Uh, energy security, I would like to call it a, a probably a cornerstone to any economy in, in Africa in particular, uh, but a much, much more important to an economy such as Zimbabwe because we are a growing economy that still needs to build and develop a lot of capacity. And to be able to do that, one of the core infrastructure uh, aspects that we need to fix is the energy space. I always joke that, uh, mostly I do that when I'm in class, that if I was the president of Africa, there are a few things I would like to fix before we can transform this continent. And one of them is definitely energy, healthcare, telecoms, education, and leadership. Then I always joke to say, maybe I start with the leadership first, then I fix energy next. But the telecom space is fully sorted. If there's one thing we've done very well even in Zimbabwe, is fixing our telecoms infrastructure. But energy is one of the biggest cornerstones for the transformation of our nation to date. The reality about energy is almost not so well understood, I believe, even if you look at the stakeholders in the energy space. There's a lot of freestyling around the conversation around the energy. That also includes trying to find all sorts of funny excuses to try to find a solution to the energy crisis. It is so vital that without a solution to energy, the turnaround or the revival of the economy will remain a mirage. There is not much that will come out if we don't fix the energy space. Why is it a problem? Because a lot of investment was supposed to have gone into the energy year in, year out. Unfortunately, when you create a gap in energy, from a utility point of view, the cost of addressing that is astronomical. I can actually bring the situation to South Africa because until three, four years ago, South Africa had a very robust energy architecture, but it's crumbling right now. They have not made the right investments over the past 20, 30 years. They cannot resolve the energy crisis in South Africa. And I'll tell you why South Africa matters to Zimbabwe. But South Africa cannot resolve the energy crisis today using coal. No one wants to fund coal today. It's frowned upon globally. Maybe you could say hydro, but at some stage in Cape Town we couldn't find a glass of water to drink. So hydro has become very delicate as a source of energy. Now you could also say nuclear, but you generate more heat than light when you talk about nuclear. It's a difficult technology, it's expensive, but if some of the first world countries are struggling to keep those nuclear plants working safely, huh, I think I would be very concerned to try to bring that technology into Africa. So energy, there is a positive correlation between energy, the availability and the development and growth of the energy infrastructure with the growth of the gross domestic product in a country. In telecoms, we used to say for every 10% improve in teledensity, there was a 1% improvement in, in, in GDP. I could actually argue that in energy, for every 1% improvement in energy availability, it could go up to 5 to 10% improvement in GDP. Now, if you doubt the impact of energy, 
you need to spend some time in markets like Nigeria because you have to understand that that generator that we are running, that cost gets thrown into everything that we consume in the economy. So there is a pass-through concept when it comes to energy. So we believe there is a solution to energy, but it just requires a change in mindset and a shift in mindset. And for Zimbabwe, I've always said, you never waste away a good crisis. Maybe it is our time to pivot and start to look at the crisis in energy as a major opportunity for us to leapfrog the ZESA uh, ecosystem. Nothing wrong with ZESA. You know, we talk about the story of Domino Pizza. Domino Pizza started selling pizza, and at some stage, they realized they were making more money from delivering pizza than selling, actually creating the pizza and selling it. And they moved away from making pizza and they, become a de they became a delivery company. And they earned a lot of profit by becoming a delivery company. Zesa. Zesa can try to become a generator of power. They can try to become a distribution company, etc., etc. Or they can say, what are we strongest at? Today, Zesa is strongest at its infrastructure. That is the trans transmission network that they've built over the years. Is it possible to reimagine now that Zesa can actually start buying power from every company in Zimbabwe? Every farm today, which is not being utilized for agriculture, should definitely go in and be utilized for energy. That's a given. So the energy crisis and the energy security in Zimbabwe is probably one of the most pivotal anchors to the revival of the economy. Now, energy also provides great opportunities for creating employment. It also provides great opportunities for improving the gross domestic product of the country, or economic revival, as they like to say it. So energy is a major platform for Zimbabwe to actually get back on the map. In fact, in particular, Zim can all of a sudden, and they are very advanced. The regulator in Zimbabwe has been very progressive. Zimbabwe is one of the few countries that actually has got net metering. So on top of your building, you can generate power and you can feed some of it into the grid. And you can draw it at night. Oops, sorry, you can't because there might be load shedding. But that's part of the problem. There is a solution to the energy crisis in Zimbabwe. And that demands the full focus of both the regulators, the government, and the private sector to transform the energy. But the technology is now there. Every building in Zimbabwe should have a solar panel on top of its roof. It's a given. And they should have a battery storage. Uh, if you don't have CAPEX, we do have the CAPEX to do that. So you can talk to us. We'll come in and deploy the money to make sure that your building is generating clean power and has got energy security and you can also do it at a much more efficient cost. Thank you. I think we have to admit and accept that um, we, uh, Southern Africa in particular, is a, an integrated energy ecosystem. And you move, we move electrons from Mozambique to South Africa, to Botswana, to Zimbabwe. And the Southern African power pool, for instance, is designed to navigate that power infrastructure. Zimbabwe, unfortunately, has to rely on its own local generation of power, and it also has to import power. Now, you have to look at energy as a currency. It's probably the closest to a US dollar currency, because it's either you're generating it from solar panels, which, of course, you have imported, or you're generating from a generator which also uses diesel, which is imported. Or you're generating from Wange, etc., etc., which requires a lot of uh, capital investment into it. If the mothership, which has been South Africa until recently, starts developing or announcing four-hour blackouts, they also start struggling. You can imagine the downhill effect to markets like Zimbabwe. 
just a, a week, a few days ago, I saw an announcement of a 12-hour blackout load shedding. No economy can survive with a 12-hour load shedding. No, well, it will. But what the impact that it does to an economy, the damage it does to an economy is very significant. So I think one of the calls is to accept that energy is, 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 is a hard currency and should be gen generated locally. What do we have in abundance in Zimbabwe? We have the sun. We have in abundance land. Yeah, that land that we forgot to plow. We have got it in abundance. The price of solar panels have dropped by nearly 90% in the past six years. So solar energy is the cheapest form of energy worldwide today. I asked my team once to do a, 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 a schematic, an artistic impression of what could happen if every roof in Harare and Blue Wayo was slapped with solar panels. We came to a conclusion that we could actually generate enough power to power the entire city, if not a good chunk of the country. And then they said, but what do we do at night? I said, well, we still have got Wange. We still have got a few of the best load that comes from uh, the existing assets. But it's much easier to solve that problem if we can slap panels everywhere. Now, the government, the regulators, needs to lay the red carpet for investors to come in and invest in energy. Because it saves the government foreign currency. When we bring in the panels, they work for the next 25 years. If you didn't know, to run a generator costs you 28 US cents per kilowatt. Doesn't matter even if you're not in energy, you will understand the numbers. To run the correct cost for ZESA should be around 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Not the subsidized two cents that we see, because that is also not sustainable. You remember, 28 cents to run a generator, 12, 13 cents to run the grid. Solar is now coming in at as low as 8 US cents per kilowatt hour. So there is not much debate around the unit economics that you get from solar. Now, unfortunately, importing energy is very expensive, especially if you are importing from your sister, your, your, your br big brother, who is also limping. So that in itself says there could be a sustainability issue. I believe if I was in South Africa, I will try to look after my economy first before I worry about the entire neighborhood. So it's energy in Zimbabwe is an existential crisis. It could torpedo, it could actually get us into a worse of economic meltdown than what we are in now. And yet, there's a very easy and very logical opportunity to create a breakthrough. In fact, if you were to ride the wave of this climate journey that we are on, you will find that there is a lot of excitement around countries that are announcing that they are going green. But not only announcing in deed, but in action. Countries that are showing traction on this renewable energy journey. For us in Zimbabwe, it's not so much about the clean energy alone or decarbonization. It's about energy security. But you'll be amazed the amount of capital sitting there waiting for a home. And that could be an opportunity for us to create a breakthrough. In the midst of this crisis, we can emerge as the number one leader in Africa when it comes to clean energy. And by so doing, you could end up attracting very interesting types of capital. And that capital is what then turns around the wheels of the economy. Thank you. COVID has brought in some very interesting dynamics to the economies of the continent and Zimbabwe also. Uh, and those dynamics, some of it has been a lot of good. COVID has demonstrated the positive impact of the investment that 
Zimbabwe, for instance, made in telecommunications infrastructure. Whether it's mobile telephony, whether it's data, whether it's fiber that has been deployed across the entire country. People have been able to work from home. Schools have been able to be conducted from home. And a lot of e-commerce platforms have emerged, thereby creating a new economy. Shared economies are beginning to emerge. I'm sure you are aware the the impact of on-demand platforms like Uber, Airbnb, etc., etc. Some of these have been made possible because of the advancement in the telecommunications infrastructure. In fact, I wonder what would have happened if we did not have an, an, a, a well-developed telecom infrastructure in Zimbabwe, for instance, during the times of COVID. Because most of us have not traveled for more than two, three years. But we've actually continued to network and do business. Most schools were closed, but the teachers were able to deliver the solutions and students were able to continue to learn. So great good coming out of there. In fact, I always argue that telecommunica telecommunications on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is just there next to the belly. That's how important telecommunications have been. They have become an absolute necessity. And that has been further validated and magnified by COVID. But with that good came issues of cybersecurity, uh, issues of controls. Now, not all controls are necessary, but some are necessary. I think most of the telecommunications players have started developing competencies and capacity to address issues of cybersecurity. We are also still yet to see the end of it because with COVID, a lot of businesses have, have closed. A lot of joblessness has become rampant in the, in the economy. And possibly a lot of cyber crimes has also increased. So a lot of businesses, ourselves included, are now looking at ways to improve on cybersecurity in general. Now, controls are good, but they need to be done after looking well into a matter. They shouldn't be done with a bad motive behind them because they will stifle a great asset. So, all I can say is when it comes to the challenges and the opportunities, the opportunities have become clear. A lot of businesses have happened. Mobile commerce has, penetration has increased. A lot of new businesses, which until now were unimaginable, have also emerged. New entrepreneurs have also emerged in the e-commerce space. Those are some of the opportunities that has emerged out of this crisis. But I think some of the challenges is to be able to navigate the terrain. I don't think Africa no, Zimbabwe is that ready to really fight the cyber challenges that we see. Even in markets like South Africa, we saw recently Transnet was attacked. And so I worry about the north of South Africa to say, how ready are we from, how ready are the corporations, the governments, how prepared are they to dealing with cyber attacks and cyber security? And it's a real threat, and it's a threat that could really cripple a lot of organizations, companies, and even government departments. There is a lot that you can attack when it comes to the ecosystem that we're working with at the moment. Thank you. Uh, gas is a very interesting space, to be honest. It's still on the borderline of renewable. I think it's a better devil than coal. Um, I suspect that uh, we see, at least here in South Africa, that a number of businesses are still investing in gas, and we think it's still a very viable uh, proposition. I will not be able to give you a more definitive uh, response on gas, but what we see, the way we see the trajectory of gas, whether it's being used for other services beyond just the energy, is that there's still value 
in the economies for gas. Uh, it will take us many, many years to be able to substitute some of the use that we have for gas. And my belief is, and what we have seen in the industries, uh, like we've got Saldana here in South Africa, we believe that it's a technology that people are still investing in. And yes, absolutely, I think it still has got its space. More than coal, which could be frowned more upon, I think gas still has got a, an audience to it. Very exciting, actually. Uh, I would like to look at it, but we can always talk offline. And yes, absolutely, as a local generation, there is an opportunity to generate power locally and possibly complement with with PV, but use it to power up the local communities. Uh, generation is what is key. I think the challenge is always, is there sufficient technology that is can scale or you're going to build it and you've got one breakdown and you have to wait for months before anyone shows up with a spare part. And, and that's the challenge with some of these technologies. Uh, we like to work with the workhorses of the industry. Is that a workhorse of the industry as a technology? Uh, and, and those are some of the determinants that drive us towards a choice of technology. And, and the ability to scale or to maintain it is key. If it becomes a very unique, isolated case, that means I need certain competencies built around that structure, and that could actually render it uh, the e render the unit economics non-viable. But listen, uh, we are open to to exploring it. It's something that we had not looked at at all, but I'd be very, very happy to get a bit more insight on it. Uh, thank you again. Um, uh, follow up on the geothermal. Yes, I do agree that it is classified as clean energy. Has enough investment gone into it? No. One of the reasons, unfortunately, is, is the complexity of location. Uh, there's always an issue about the environmental impact. It's still on the borderline. Uh, in some places, they think it could cause earthquakes, etc., etc. So there is a lot of, I think, anxiety around geothermal as a technology. Uh, and right now, you want to build something that can scale. Yes, the Bedbury site could be a good site, but can you use the bridge? Can it scale? Now, you can spend time developing that, but by the time you are done, I would have built a gigawatt easily in Mutare, just using PV. So uh, you have seen a lot of uh, islands in the Caribbean which are powered fully by solar. So, so I think geothermal's biggest handicap has been the inability to scale it. Not so much an argument about its cleanliness as a source of energy. It has got the good credentials, but it has got a scalability challenge. Uh, I won't be able to get into greater detail on it. You could end up, I think, uh, me getting into unfamiliar territory on the technology itself and some of the reasons why it hasn't scaled. But we don't use it, we don't consider it as an alternative. Probably before we go to the, the geothermal, we would have to talk about wind if we can find it and possibly even hydro. And certainly hydrogen is becoming a lot more topical because most of your big minds are beginning to tilt towards hydrogen as an alternative source. So I think geothermal, it might be just a factor of scaling and, and some of its uh, limitations when it comes to location and also just borderline environmental impact. Uh, Tendai, I think the concept of um, crowdfunding, I, I would like to speak about it in general. And then I can always make reference to some of the case studies that I've been involved with. Uh, I've said I've got a day job and a night job. And so in the crowdfunding that I've been involved with is mostly in my night job space. And in all of us, we should have a day job and a night job. Uh, because I'm told most of us only use 11% of our brain power. So I've always wondered what happens to the other 8 and 9% of our brain power. Uh, 
my father taught me a lot. He ended up with four wives and 27 children. So he was creative in that direction. So I'm sure there is a lot more one can do. Uh, one of the biggest ch concerns that I hear, particularly when I'm lecturing, is access to capital. We've got great ideas, but there's no money. The banks won't talk to us. The banks won't talk to us because we don't have this correct surname. We are of the wrong color. We come from the wrong tribe. We are from the wrong family. I like to say that is a lot of mumbo jumbo. Resources follow strategy. So how do you raise money to build an entrepreneurial culture in a country? A Silicon Valley is known for entrepreneurship. The way they think, the way they do their things is very different from the rest of the world. Even the things they value most, particularly talent, coders, IT, machine learning, they have put a lot of premium on that type of intellectual capital. So, the question about how do we make, how do we create resources to invest in really whatever you decide to invest? One of the underestimated, the underrated platforms in Africa or in Zimbabwe is a concept called crowdfunding. Not that it's new. I always marvel that I was told Uber, before Uber, there was a company called Lyft. And Lyft, the word Lyft came from actually Zimbabwe. Why do those things matter? What you find is crowdfunding has been happening. Chimbazo, I think they used to call it. Uh, Stockfeller, they call it here. By creating, you working, say, for instance, using the telecom infrastructure. There's a many of us here. I last count as 165 of us here. I could argue with you that if I could wear my marketing hat, and I could sell you a great story. I could easily raise $20 million from the bunch on this call right now. I, that assumes, of course, that I've got a story to tell. That assumes that I've got a product to sell. Crowdfunding, as a principle, is an underrated platform for raising capital. But for a country like Zimbabwe, where we are in the doldrums and Employment is very low. There are no new jobs coming up in the economy. One of the places we now need to look to is to create entrepreneurs who are able to start their own businesses, who are able to build something for themselves and not to be standing in the queue waiting for a job. My argument and my learnings in Africa is that it's never so much about how much money you have. Some of you might not be aware that Airbnb, Airbnb was started with $500 borrowing from the guy's mother. The young man borrowed $500, went to the supermarket and bought cereals, if you know cereals, brought them into his apartment, split the cereal into two boxes, he poured one and he branded it the o Obama o Oreos. And he poured the half of the other cereal into the other bag and he branded Captain McCain. That was at a time when Obama and McCain were busy campaigning. He took the, the searches and went to the convention center and he sold the cereals. Of course, no prize in guessing which cereals sold more. Most likely the Obama o cereals. After that, he took $500, sold the cereals, came back, went back to the shops again, bought another pack of cereals, did the same process, made another $750, $1,500, and he set up his first website. The power of a mindset. It's got nothing to do with money. Airbnb, I don't know, valuation could be in the $80 to $100 billion today. But in 2008, the young men had to borrow $500. So money has got nothing to do with it. Your surname has got nothing to do with it. It's, a, it's an entrepreneurial mindset. And we need 
both in our families and in our communities need to find a way to encourage such. And crowdfunding is one of them. Where do you crowdfund? You can crowdfund within your own family. That's also crowdfunding. You can crowdfund among your alumni groups. A lot of you on your phones, you've got WhatsApp groups. Uh, some of them, there are too many to, to number. All those are opportunities for crowdfunding. Of course, assuming you've got something to share or to sell, you've got an idea that is worth investing into. But money and investment is not a problem. Even in Zimbabwe, where there's very little foreign currency, you will be amazed at the number of people in the diaspora who would jump onto an opportunity in Zimbabwe and they would invest with you. That also assumes you are selling a Panadol, not a vitamin C. What is a Panadol? It's an idea that has got a real market. It's an idea that captures, captivates a real need. What's a vitamin C? It's a nice to have. You see, part of the problem, I call it the quail syndrome, chiwuta syndrome in Zimbabwe. And my neighbor starts to doing quail, selling chiwuta to a restaurant. Before you know it, everyone is flocking and trying to do chiwuta. Quail. But you don't know why A started doing quail. He was supplying one restaurant. There's only one restaurant that does quails. Why are you all flocking into doing quails when you don't know why A is doing quails? Here already has a captive market. Then you turn around and say, ah, maybe I name Shonga. That's why Ruta Shakeshi Tenge. So no, no, no. He actually had a restaurant he was supplying. All you did was to bastardize his market when you came in without understanding what you are trying to do. So money is not a problem, but finding a bankable idea, which I call a panadol idea, is where the problem is. So I got involved in property in my night job. So I encourage a number of Pan-Africans because I know we have got an affinity towards owning property. So some of them I said, if you can afford your own house, you can buy an apartment. We're doing South Africa, soon we're moving to Kenya. You can buy a lifestyle apartment and you can get annuity income for the next 50 years. Be our guest. Oh no, I don't have the full investment to own a property. What can I do? You can do a fractional title. That's also crowdfunding. So I get 30 people coming together, owning an apartment, and enjoy the same yield as Paul, who owns his own unit. It's fairly straightforward. Similarly in agriculture, I've always said, don't underestimate the power of starting a goat business. Because I started a goat business in Zimbabwe, and lo and behold, they all sold out to OK stores. And I made a very good margin. I bought the goat for $30, kept it for nine months, sold it for around $70. In US dollars, whatever, even if you go to New York, my return was better than most uh, listed entities in New York, just from goat business. You never despise those kind of beginnings. But core is to figure out, create an idea, then the money will follow. So the concept of crowdfunding for me was, is a way to say, how do you build such platforms? And it's not very complicated. You don't need all sorts of algorithms to build a crowdfunding. They, in this group, is the first crowdfund we can start. You'll be surprised what we could do if we could just put $100 every month and buy a stock on the stock market. In three, four years, we'll probably be owning a blue chip listed company in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Tendai, I think my book uh, talks about strategy, how to run businesses very effectively in Africa. My book talks about trade-offs, how to make strategic trade-offs. It also covers execution, what makes an effective organizational execution culture. I also talk about, at great length, values. What defines leadership value? What defines you as a leader? You need to be able to be crystal clear what your values are as, a, as an individual. Everyone that I've worked with over the past 15 years knows my five values. Legacy, one of them. 
the day I die, I would like to invite you to and I, and you are supposed to say, here lies a young man, hopefully I will soon be young then. He taught me one or two things. I value him a lot. That's legacy for me. Integrity. I like to sleep well at night. That's my second value. I love a good night's sleep. Even in Nigeria, looking after a $300 million budget, I still slept very well at night. Lifelong learning is the third value. What does that mean? I like to continuously improve myself. I wrote the book as part of me living that lifelong learning value. I challenge my team that I'm able to read two books every week now. Of course, thanks to Audible. I just start my car and the chapter comes on. The third value, fourth value is work. And the fifth value is profit. Those are my values. If you work with me, you have to know those values and they are sacrosanct, non-negotiable. So those are the things that I cover in the book, including turnarounds and some of the case studies of how we have built significant businesses in the continent. But I could not finish the book without covering a subject of great interest, which is leadership in Africa, even at a political level. I said the first law of wars, if you're a golfer, when, you, when you're in a bunker or when you're in a bush, try to come out of the bush. That's why we shout well out. In Africa, we fell into a wall and we continued digging. What does the wall look like? We forgot that to run a government effectively, you need the same set of discipline and competencies is running a private organization, company. When you're in a company and you're a shareholder, you don't look for the most talkative driver. I've got nothing wrong with the drivers. They're good at what they do. But you don't look for the most talkative driver and make him the CEO. You don't take the most uh, charismatic intern and make him finance minister. You look for a guy who is a chartered accountant or some guy who has got a very strong experience in finance. Similarly in IT, you can literally map the entire government and you can map the Minister of Finance is Finance Director, the Minister of Telecoms is IT Director, a Minister of Energy is Power, Head of Power, etc., etc. I highlighted earlier on to say Singapore got it right. And if you look at what they did and who they are today, everything was attributed to the quality of the people they selected into their leadership position, particularly as ministers and whether it's permanent secretaries or directors and ministries. So the last chapter of the book for me goes into that space. I've shared that book with probably seven to eight presidents. I just sent one to His Excellency recently. But I've shared with eight presidents. And some of them have actually written me back. And they made specific reference to that last chapter. We need, as a people, to admit that we need to work with our governments. In fact, I've got a concept in the book called AJIP, any government in power. And when I heard that term in Nigeria. Now, it was used, actually, very sarcastically to say, this guy, we call him Bohika. Bend over, here it comes again. Bend over. So what he did is, a new government, you just bend over, keep it more shut, then it will go and pass. And they adopted this, we will work with any government of the day. Then I thought, there is a wisdom in that. But maybe not from a sarcastic perspective, but from a real realistic perspective. Because the government of the day is one that you have to deal with. When you are looking at macroeconomics in the boardroom, you are talking about the government of the day. Maybe if the Minister of Energy calls you to come to a meeting and contribute to a conversation around the energy legislation or net tariffing, willing, distributed energy, maybe you should show up. You don't have to show up because there is an opportunity for a ministerial job. You should just show up and contribute. And then I thought to myself, what if a lot of uh, the people actually put their hands up and says to the government of the day, 
we are available to save you. Where can we save you? How can we save you? I know there's a lot of cynicism in that story. But in America, they've got a concept called super PACs. Who are super PACs? It's the George Soros, etc., etc. I won't name names. Super PACs work with the government of the day because their interests are intricately connected to the government of the day. We need to walk away from this MDCs and OPF crap because that's not where the solution is coming in. The government of the day is what we work with. And if it changes, we work with the next government of the day. The government needs to come to the corporate world or what I like to call AJIP, any government. It's a group of professionals who make themselves available to save the government of the day. And the Minister of Energy should have his own AJIP group. The Minister of Finance is on AJIP. And these have to be professionals. Their interest is the same as that of government. Because if, if the currency goes haywire, so is their business. If inflation goes haywire, so is their business. So you can't hide in your boardroom and say, I don't do politics. You are doing politics in your boardroom. Because that's all you are looking at. The exchange rate doesn't work. The currency doesn't work. The macroeconomy doesn't work. You can't travel. You've got sanctions. Work with the government of the day. So that is the last chapter of the book. Yeah, I was scared to write that piece, but they haven't, no one has bothered me because I think we just tried to be factual. The government of the day needs our support. How can we come to the party and work with them? You never throw away a baby with the bathwater. You have to be able to pick some of the good that exist in a system. We also don't live in an island. We say if you, if you stay next to a funeral, a cemetery, you don't cry for everyone who, come, who dies at that cemetery. We live in Africa. Politics is part of us. But we've also seen some countries that are beginning to emerge because the business community works closely with the government. The U.S., the super PACs I mentioned, work very closely with the government. And some of the economies that have done very well, the business is involved in supporting the government of the day. There's a lot of talent in the business world. Maybe it's time for the business to go and tell the government that, what, why don't you do the fundamentals, what you do best? And we will do business, including all those parastatals. Get rid of them. Because government is not geared to manage or run parastatals. They're not good at it. Now tell me which part of Africa have we done it very well. And yet they could monetize those and unlock a lot of value, including employment generation, including raising GDP, and increasing productivity in a nation by allowing the private sector to come in and invest and generate the much needed foreign direct investment into the country. So that's the last chapter of the book. As I said, it's available. It's been in the circulation for five years now, and it has served us very well, both at an academic level, but also at a business level. It's on Kindle, it's, on, it's in Audible, it's also on Amazon. Of course, we can arrange to make sure that you get your own copy delivered to your home, thanks to the e-commerce platforms that have emerged in, the, in Zimbabwe. Thank you all. Due to the uh, question on energy in rural Africa, uh, I, I would address it uh, more holistically uh, in that um, uh, there is a view that 600 million Africans today do not have access to power in Africa. The biggest opportunity in the continent sits with a service that has got a captive market of 600 million people. So for those of you that are in business, you can see the addressable market is big and it's very could be very profitable. However, rural Africa today, some of the growth points you see in Zimbabwe have not had power for more than 100 years. And yet these growth points are running a small generator, a small solar lantern systems from China, etc., etc. Et we don't believe that is a very sustainable solution. I'm told it's actually a very condescending solution. 
you are going to a village woman and you are saying, no, you only need a light and you only need your radio. Is that true? If you were to ask her what she needs, would she only talk about that or she would say, fridge would also do my son. And so is a television too. I wouldn't mind a stove. So we now believe there is a solution that can be deployed into rural Zimbabwe and can completely reinvent rural Zimbabwe today. In fact, we have piloted a system in plum tree in a place called Ndolwane. And the concept is called Ugesi. Ugesi is a Ndevele Zulu word for energy. There we have created a mini grid. There we have built Seca 100 kilowatt system. We have built a transmission network up to five kilometers from the mini grid. We found out that they were grocery stores that were powering, trying to cool Coca-Cola and milk using a small little generator. We also found that there's a primary school, there's a clinic, in some cases there is even a secondary school. But there are also a number of farmers surrounding the growth point. We know the economic impact of providing electrons to any community but most impactfully providing electrons to the rural folk. Most governments in Africa, Zimbabwe included, does have a fund meant to promote rural electrification. Dare I say most governments have not utilized that money that well. Not because probably that they have not had a better use of it, but probably because models have not been developed to facilitate that. So in Dolwane, what you find when you get there is we have connected the primary school, the secondary school, the clinic, and we have created what we call Ugesi farmers in the area. They are doing poultry chickens, broilers, and we found out that broilers do very well when there's light. And we connected these farmers to Peter Cunningham, who is based in Bulawayo, to say, Peter, when their broilers are ready, can you come and fetch them? He's a philanthropist, so he was happy to do so. But you can literally send box this concept and take it into every growth point in Zimbabwe. They are investors what we call patient investors out there who are running foundations who are running patient capital who are actually very keen to deploy capital to transform a rural community just imagine for a minute once you put lights at a growth point let me tell you what happened to a growth point lights bring life they start to make do their hair makeup they start to do an internet cafe. They start to do cold storage for food. They, you can even start to dig bowl and pump bowl water out. Poultry, horticulture. Can you, can you follow me? You're already beginning to create a small town. And, and that activity could actually create what we call reverse migration. Where people are going to leave the congested city and go into the village because there's lights there. The power of lights. So this concept called Ugesi, we are now rolling it out across Zimbabwe, but we've got a number of other countries that have also expressed a strong interest. It is how we are going to reimagine rural Africa and rural Zimbabwe. And the technology works. We're not talking about these small little uh, Mickey Mouse solar that was just imported cheap ones. These are what we call tier one technologies. The top of the range. The one that we put at our data centers. The one that we put at telecom switching centers. These are the kind of technologies that are robust and they work. Then someone said, oh, but there's no money in rural. I said, well, you must be living in the wrong world. Because when we build a telecom base station in that rural area, we were told that you will not make money for the next 20 years because people in the rural don't have money. 
Yet we showed up exactly 20 days later and this telecom tower was congested. And we were all baffled. Where did the money come from? Of course it came from the city. There is remittances. Money is coming straight from London into a village now and you are able to buy power. And your grandmother can actually have power and watch some beautiful desperate housewife. I don't know if they're showing now. So we believe that energy in itself can be so transformational in firstly even helping with the shifting of migration from the city back into the village if we can just start to embrace the potential of energy in rural Africa. Thank you. Uh, Perpetua, I would be very brief. Yes, I think the geothermal space Part of the challenges we have today is the drive towards more and more cleaner energy. The most technologies that are borderline uh, is carbon and friendly are beginning to receive less and less attention. Though the demand in Africa is very real. For so most people who ask me, when I show up at a spa or at an orchestra or any of your businesses, I'm not going to be very selective on what technology I offer you. What I can tell you as a bare minimum is I have to use your roof and I have to use your car park. And if you've got a small piece of land next door to you, I would like that piece of land to put solar. And by the way, I love the idea that beyond farming maize, you can now farm solar. So for most of you, you've got massive pieces of land. For a megawatt, I need one hectare. If you've got 50 hectares, I would like to be able to show up and build a solar farm there. The future is solar. It is almost a natural good gift like my, a microwaves in telecoms. So, our offer will always remain a hybrid offer. We don't have the luxury of choice. So geothermal will be part of our hybrid offering, but we try, we start to clean out and over a period of time, and hopefully in due course, we can start to substitute and move more and more towards 100% carbon neutrality. But we have to accept that certain technologies will continue to stay with us. So for most businesses in Zimbabwe, when I show up, I will finance your generator, make no mistake, I'll put money in your generator, I'll put solar, and I'll possibly put a small little battery solution. And I'll finance all that. All you have to do is to sign a 15-year lease, if you're a blue chip company, of course. If your credit profile is not very good, then I will do it, and you can put that system on your balance sheet. And I'll maintain it for you for the next 15 years. As soon as the economics change, I'll probably come and take my system back, and I can give you your money with profit. So our desire is to, we offer financing for all our energy solutions, but that is a full and holistic energy proposition, not just solar only. We will invest in your generator, we will invest in batteries if they are needed, and we sort of say if you're a dairy body, your core business is milk, not energy. Energy is an accident of history. In your other world out there, they don't worry about trying to manage generators. If you're okay, you're a grocery store, you're not an energy company. Work with us, let us deliver an energy solution to you and focus on your meeting. Thank you. This month, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if I understood your question, you wanted to understand the distrust and since you quoted the, our AVI post, which is the property fund, you were asking about the barriers, the distrust and the opportunities. If I got your question right, and forgive me if I missed it because I was trying to read it clearly, but what happened? I, I had a group of Kenyans, Tanzanians, a few Zimbabweans, Nigerian, Congolese, all top executives in telecoms, some with Deloitte, PwC, and banks. What has been some of the challenges? Um, number one, uh, I don't know what, what is this head mentality. Among the Kenyans on their own, what they say to me is, Oga, they call me Oga, from my Nigerian days, Oga, we have tried to do this thing, or oh, it doesn't work. We ended up not talking to each other. Families broke because we were trying to do this whole crowdfunding issue. 
Um, and, and similarly among the Tanzanians, there was always an element of distrust. I marveled because it is the same feeling I get every time I try to engage Zimbabweans only to do anything of not. And so I do a lot of entrepreneurship talks to groups like this one. Normally I don't do it this level of sensitivity because this is not my territory. I don't like sensitive stuff. We normally like to talk about the fun stuff, investment, entrepreneurship, crowdfunding, building businesses. That is my forte. But because of the hazards of my book, I then am forced to address certain things that I then lose sleep over. But I found out very clearly it's a struggle. And I don't know what it is, but I only attribute it to a mentality or just a mindset. A, 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 why, why is this? Who, who is behind it? Why did I attribute our success in AVI, this is our property fund, from the fact that we were actually a minority? So the dominant groups is the Kenyans and Tanzanians in our group. And I think we actually provided a nice balance for them. So one of the unfortunate things is we need to go past this mindset and learn to trust each other. Now, but trust doesn't come, doesn't come because you are, you, are, you, are, you are verbally very eloquent. It has to come, you have to earn it. So when I built the first platform, I literally had to expose my entire life to my investors. My company bought me a new car, so I had to take a picture of the registration book and I had to send it to the whole group. Because the first, after four months of them sending their subscriptions, they saw me driving a brand new car. So I had to tell them, so, so it's not your car, it's my, it's my company car. It's the company paid for the car. When they came for their annual AGM in Johannesburg, I had to take them individually to every unit. And when I got there, I had to show them the actual title deed for the unit in the name of the company. So I had to show a lot of transparency. Of course, I had to tell them that I have worked for two billionaires in Africa. Mo Ibrahim is one of them. The other one won't mention a name. And they've trusted me with their money and I've been very judicious with it. So maybe I'm all, I won't run away with a million dollars. So it's very important that those who decide to take the leadership, they have to allow themselves to be vulnerable and to be, to be answering the questions, including the uncomfortable questions. Even when I do the talks lately on the crowdfunder, one of them yesterday asked me, hey, where is your office exactly? We want to visit and touch you and feel you. I said, okay, you can come. This is my office. You can come. My house is here. And here is 15,000 people on my LinkedIn that you can get reference. Or better still, go to my book. There's 70,000 people there. You can get reference. Uh, I'm a decent man from Zishabane. There isn't got much to it. And don't worry, every moyo you know out there is not related to me. What you see is what you get. But you can get reference on me. You can do your due diligence. So, unfortunately, that mindset is so embedded in us. And yet, despite how successful we are individually in corporate Africa, we have failed to do enough together. There's a book called The Money Code, How to Become a Millionaire Using the Jewish Code. And I can give you a lot of these books that I read, but I have seen a mindset that the Jews have, which they're able to pass from generation to generation. And what we did with the Allied Value team was to create generational wealth. I told them the $1,000 for these guys was peanuts. I call it hate money, H-U-R-T. Enough to keep their attention, but not too big to lose sleep over. So please, get off my back. If you can't commit to $1,000 and not lose sleep over it, don't come to this fund. If you can, do it. But as I speak today, their share price has gone up in US dollars by almost 40% post-COVID. This is the share of the property company. Now they are smiling, but when they caught in, it was small money. But we wanted to build a mindset. So I don't, I have not lost hope that you can do it among Zimbabweans. I've always said try to increase diversity and make sure that when I say increase diversity, I mean more women than men. You have got a better chance. We say when a woman rules, even streams run upstream. 
rivers run upstream. So get more diversity. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tendai. Uh, I think you asked a question about the cancer of the economic stagnation and a mindset. How does it how has it affected the people's mindset? I have heard a lot of views about, uh, and some of it there is a truth to it that uh, we have lost a generation of Zimbabweans that were very hardworking who appreciates a, an eight to five day job that were willing to put in the work to gain an income out of it. Instead, we have created a generation of dealers and wheelers. We've also, I think, robbed our people of hope and purpose. I think the most ugly thing about economic meltdowns and economic hardship is that it destroys the DNA of a society. It adulterates the DNA of a people. At a time in Nigeria, we actually flew to London to bring back a number of Nigerians back into the business because we felt we could not turn around the business without a certain injection of a certain DNA into the organization. And indeed, we were able to grow that business to be to close 2009 at a $1.8 billion business. And part of it was the, the infusion of a certain DNA back into a business. So it is a real concern that the economic hardship has deprived and taken away a lot of that entrepreneurial and work ethic that we are known for as Zimbabweans. For a while, we were one of the most educated countries in Africa. We also have got talent that has been able to run most of the continent, if not the globe, to date. I always brag about some of my Zimbabwean uh, professionals out there. Someone told me there's a gentleman called James Manika, who is based in the US with McKinsey. And there's a story that he actually advised Barack Obama's uh, government. Oops, he's a Zimbabwean. In fact, when I talked to a few politicians, they did not know him. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. So you don't know your own who is actually advise, advising such a world class. I talk about people like Nathan Kalumb. I was told he was probably the fourth most highest ranking in Coca-Cola during his time. I also checked with some of my friends that I play golf with, some are politicians. And they were not aware of some of these names. And it baffles me to say, wow, if you come into a market like South Africa, there's a lot of blue chip companies that are run by Zimbabweans. Oh, when I was in Bahrain, there were a number of top executives in Standard Chartered Bank Bahrain. So is Nigeria, so is Tanzania, so is Kenya. So we have got such a pool of talent that we have built, but we have lost a generation or two as a result of some of the meltdown that we have seen. I always, it pains me because it's a case that we pass on to the next generation. They will struggle to emerge out of there because they've never known a good day's job for a good day's pay. They were forced very quickly into what I call has hustling. Now I've lived in Nigeria, so I have seen how a culture of hustling becomes a DNA of a country. And it can take a lifetime to be able to eradicate that from the system. So negativity comes from the environment that we have created as a result of some of the challenges that we've had. So yes, I call on, you remember I said, we need to call upon the leadership to say, how do we help this nation to turn around. I like to give the case of Singapore. In one generation, Singapore turned from a third world country 
to a first world country. One generation. Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew was this president. When he came in, he came and he chose the cream de la cream of the corporate leaders and he gave them a ministerial job. And people like to debate about that. No, I will take the CEO of Standard Chartered or Barclays and I'll make him the Minister of Finance. And I'll make sure that he gets paid the correct salary that he would have earned when he was a CEO of Barclays. It could sound like it's very high. Wait until you see the cost of botched up tenders. Wait until you see the cost of unfinished roads. I have roads in Zimbabwe that go many years without being finished. Some of them, I think, have even forgotten that we're building them. Leadership cannot be underestimated. And to transform and to recreate and to rebuild that damage we have created to the generation in Zimbabwe, we need to take ownership and responsibility at a leadership level. And when I say leadership, is the political, is the corporate, and the civic leadership. A government is about all of us. It's not about a few people in, 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 the, in the White House or Blue House or Yellow House. It's about a, the ecosystem of the people. The hate and the damage, and we are stealing away life from the next generation. It saddens me when I share with people that my stream was probably the last one to enjoy a certain level of funding support from the government. And I finished school many, many years ago. And since then, that system has collapsed. We need to take responsibility and we need to do what is right. So unfortunately, there is a cause and effect. So what you see, the behaviors you see, the negativity you see, this whole idea of arbitrage, everything is about arbitrage. No, no, I'm going to give you a computer. You want to put a markup on it. You haven't added any value to it. It's an arbitrage economy. That can never last. And it becomes a cancer that can eat away the entire social fabric of a country. And if you've been to Africa, you know what I mean. When you eat away that. There was a quote by Martin Meredith. I quoted it in my book that he says, when you visit Africa 50 years later, a European wanted to visit Africa. And he said, what should I carry when I'm going to this African country? And the answer was simple. Please tell me when that country got its independence. If it's 50 years and beyond, I would like you to carry the candles, carry the lights, blankets, and torch and everything. And if it only got its independence 20 or so years ago, just carry your passport and your credit card. If you look at the correlation of some of the developmental challenges that the continent has faced, this author was spot on. Those countries that had gained independence 50 years and beyond were in tatters. The newly independent were still looking good. Now we're not being political, neither are we being racist, we're just being factual. These are statistically supported facts. We have a responsibility as a generation. And in my book, Tendai, I mention that we, myself included, everyone on this call, needs to stand up and be counted. This idea that you hide in the boardroom, trust me, certain people are going to be legislating on behalf of your industry. And they could be security guards, and they could be people who have never, who, understand, who don't understand how to use a mobile phone. Then they'll be writing the legislation for, for telecommunications, or for energy for that matter. Because the ones who are capable say politics is dirty, I don't want to go there. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Honorable Super, uh, for your question. Uh, we have, uh, our paths have crossed in the past, so it's very good to see you, sir. Um, you asked about the coal deposits. Uh, like I, be I don't believe that um, as a continent we are yet out of the woods or we are able to embrace some of the uh, uh, rhetoric that is out there. We still need what we call best load minister. Uh, best load is needed to keep the lights on. 
best load in Africa has to come out of coal. It has to come out of hydro. It can come out of wind energy. Well, not so much wind actually, but certainly hydro and coal. Now, we are aware that the move, the winds are going against coal. But I think as we have clearly outlined, it is going to take us another 10 to 15, if not 20 years, to be able to find an alternate storage solution. And it could come in the form of lithium batteries, obviously. That is the technology of choice from an energy mix perspective. We would love every government building to have solar on top and the battery storage solution. We work with Tesla Power Wars and Tesla Megapex now so we can deliver much larger. But currently the demand for lithium batteries is so high that we don't believe that in the near future the price will come down significantly to be able to address what we call the best load, which is what is needed, for instance, at night. I can power most of the building during the day using solar, but solar doesn't work at night. So at night I need a hydro and water is a problem or I need coal. So the investment in coal will be with us for a foreseeable future, albeit dwindling and dying because there is a need to comply with the demand of the climate environment that we are living in. But energy security for Africa is unfortunately a much more pressing issue, I, I dare not say, than decarbonization. But I don't believe we will have a very nice conversation with our people if they are going to, be, to have lights off at night because we are trying to save coal. We know that coal is going to be with us for a while. But you will struggle to raise capital today from many corners of the world. Most of the banking institutions will not fund coal. Now, but we know that we have to keep up the lights on. Africa's situation is a lot more unique to the rest of the world, particularly the Western world. Because in the Western world, the carbon effect is a lot more uh, pronounced than blackouts. And now when you start having blackouts, it's becoming a, a, a real challenge. You're in the dark. So there has to be an energy mix, but it's going to be evolving away from coal. So I believe eventually that is going to be this journey where slowly and slowly we will continue to provide best load with coal, while it's we are renovating and creating newer and cleaner sources of energy. Part of it includes hydrogen, which is coming up. Gas also seems to be coming up. But like I said, lithium is gaining momentum. Unfortunately, lithium, there is a demand for it on the electric vehicles. There is a demand for it in many other places beyond just storing power. So for a season, we are going to continue to see a huge demand for lithium, and that won't help with bringing the price of lithium down to make it a real sustainable source of storage.